good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to see you with us today. Uh, welcome on behalf of the Center for Policy Studies. And uh, this is the fifth discussion within the Protecting Democratic Values by Attacking Pandemic Related Disinformation Project. And I'm glad that in addition to our project participants from Romania and Latvia, we have also uh, two more participants who will make presentations today. Milena Kolovas-Vancharova from NT Center Bulgaria and Vojcik Kushevilski from uh, the uh, Editor-in-Chief of Visegrad Insight in Poland. So, uh, Milena, I would perhaps ask you to join the floor first and uh, it's a great pleasure to have this first time on board a member of the European Observatory Against Disinformation to which we also joined some time ago and uh, I'm looking forward to your presentation about uh, cognitive aspects of uh, perception of uh, some disinformation or conspiracy theories. I would like just to mention that today we asked the participants to have covered different topics that we may have covered in part or have not covered, and then the others will probably add more and make some comments and ask questions. So, uh, Milena, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Armen. Thank you. Do you hear me? Yes. And if you need to share screen, it's enabled. Yes, please. Yes, please. I would like to share my screen. So, so it's enabled, yes. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to speak uh, in, in, front of, uh, in, in front of your team. Uh, actually, it's a great honor for us to share the results of uh, some of our uh, activities focused on this information in the recent years. I don't know uh, how, how close it is to, to what uh, you are dealing with, but uh, uh, actually, I hope that this will bring uh, um, an interesting insight into uh, our work. Uh, I am a, a project manager and researcher and the National Training Center, which is an organization uh, focused on educational activities. In fact, we develop educational and training pro programs uh, which aim at um, addressing various issues and deficiencies uh, in the mainstream education. And one such an issue, definitely not only for us, but for the rest of the countries, as far as we are aware, is uh, uh, the so-called information literacy of uh, learners and educators, and more, more specifically, the skills to identify and counterfeit uh, fake news and disinformation, which has turned into the so-called uh, uh, infodemic of, uh, of the latest days. Uh, so I will, I will start uh, my presentation with uh, a very brief introduction to the basis, uh, the scientific base of our work without going into detail, of course, because it's just, uh, the aim is just to be very, uh, to keep it very popular. So if we are to trust the discoveries of neuroscience on how the human brain works, our uh, human inclination to disinformation is simply inevitable. The main culprits are the amygdala, which modulates memories and the prefrontal cortex, responsible for the abilities to differentiate among conflicting thoughts, to determine what is good and what is bad, what is same and what is different. And also it is responsible for working towards a defined goal, prediction of outcomes and social control. Another important brain center, uh, the actual hub of information flow from the senses is the thalamus, uh, on this slide, you can see to the right hand side of the slide, you can see the depiction of the route along which information received as a result from emotional stimuli turns into emotional response within milliseconds. So this is probably the shortest possible introduction to, uh, to the topic. Uh, on uh, which are the responsible brain, which is this responsible brain infrastructure. So from it, it may be concluded that the target of uh, disinformation are the cognitive shortcuts through which we process the newly received information. 
In our work on de facto, which is a project successfully completed and uh, which dealt with disinformation, especially in educational context, we established four leading concepts borrowed from cognitive psychology and linguistics that explain a lot about the process of um, and the impact of disinformation. These four concepts reveal what we call the cognitive layer of disinformation. By raising the awareness of their existence, we may help people to be more protected against manipulation attempts. The first of those concepts is the idea of the so-called frames as thinking contexts. Actually, this term is borrowed, uh, um, it was first introduced to, to scientific field by the, the, the British anthropologist Gregory Bateson and further on developed by the um, cognitive scientist George Lakoff. And the idea behind it is that people think in well-defined contexts known as frames. For example, if you think of, a, of the school as a frame, this frame contains textbooks, desks, whiteboard, teachers, students, you name it. These are all objects with a semantic role of their own, which dictates their expected behavior or function. Or, for example, if you look at the slide that I have prepared, uh, this is the, a depiction of the newly established COVID-19 frame, which is so overwhelmingly powerful because of the scale of the pandemic affecting every aspect of today's living. Can you guess which of the pictures that you see fits the frame and which not? Our minds actually tend to evaluate objects, actions, and facts as being real or true when they correspond to the frame and just the opposite as not being real or being false and fake when they do not fit into our um, cognitive frames. Frames are automatically invoked uh, each time uh, when a communication process uh, refers to them and uh, the mind chooses the path of lesser resistance. Neuron, connection, new neuron connections are strengthened each time when um, we confirm a fact which already fits the established frame. These frames uh, are different for each person. Even if, you, if, you, uh, if I refer to the example I just gave you, the idea of school might be different from person to person. Uh, but uh, uh, this, this is why the evaluation of, uh, of what is real and what is not is very subjective. And this explains why a single fact or information can be evaluated, perceived, or even recorded in a different manner and with a different connotation. You see what is the impact on uh, the information flow uh, of this uh, concept that we have uh, figured out. Frames are very, very slow to form and equally difficult to change. And sometimes they are even impossible to change. The second concept uh, in our systematic framework is a so-called uh, systemic causality. Normally, our brains deal very well with direct cause and effect relations. Such, for example, we expect that in the summertime it's going to be hot, in the winter time the weather is rather cold. Well, nowadays it's a mess, <laughs> but still, this is what our expectation is. Um, our brain puts together sequences of cause and effects which come from observable situations. The systemic causality is about things that cannot be observed as they are outside the, the direct sensory perception through our senses, eyesight, hearing, taste, olfaction, and touch. In reality, most of the information which is propagated through online media is not binary in nature, it is systemic, which means that we cannot say that this is true or false or that it is about a yes or no or black and white. It is, um, uh, this means that a single fact which we can observe and on which we can agree is indeed a result of complex cause and effect beyond uh, our direct perception. I have selected an example to show you this. This is a headline from a Bulgarian newspaper. And the headline says, men escaped the quarantine of Vansko, found that. This is a good example of how a complex event is presented as direct cause and effect. It is from the early COVID-19 days when a small town in southwestern Bulgaria uh, was the first to be locked down due to three cases of uh, positive COVID tests. This happened in, in March last year. As you can see, the title strongly suggests a link between the illegal escape and the sudden death of the 60-year-old man, further implicating that it had to do with the new and mysterious virus. 
Later on, this casualty was proved to have had no relation to COVID-19 whatsoever. Uh, sorry. Uh, the third concept in our uh, framework is uh, known as motivated cognition. It reveals the important aspect in understanding how we perceive the world and why we tend to assign unrealistically high trust to information received by those who are close to us, as opposed to other people and members of other groups. Our goals or needs motivate our cognition. For example, our financial interests or our deeply inborn need for positive self-perception shape the way we evaluate facts and take decisions. Uh, a straightforward, another example. In situations when the goals are not are not clearly set and beliefs are still to be established, motivation could be easily used to manipulate. One such an example is the vaccination campaign featuring celebrities and politicians who received the anti-COVID-19 shot. You know that this is happening all over the world now and we may take it as a positive or a positive manipulation or at least a campaign which is aiming at something good. It's not exactly the case with the next slide to show you. This is the notorious claim by former President uh, Donald Trump that injecting UV light inside the body can kill COVID-19. You know that there was a series of, of claims like that, which caused some uh, casualties in the United States. And again, the mechanism which triggered the reaction of people uh, can be uh, labeled as motivated cognition because those people used their, their stances as uh, very authoritative figures in society to influence other people's reactions. So the fourth and last of our concept within our system, within our theoretical framework is the so-called equivalence and emphasis. It refers, equivalence refers to statements which are logically equivalent, but phrased differently. Thus, uh, the phrasing causes individuals to alter their preferences. By the way, this is very much, very frequently used in, in, in the course of uh, political elections, for example. With emphasis, people make different judgments depending on which aspect of a statement was intentionally emphasized by the provider of the information. Again, an example, this is the very famous and um, popular uh, COVID-19 alert, which contains all the data, which is shown on daily basis. Uh, and it, it announces the, new the, rates, the daily rates of new cases, recoveries and COVID casualties. There seems to be a correlation between the choice of which part of the data to announce first and the government's decisions on whether to tighten or release the restrictions on daily life. Of course, I'm, I'm driving on examples from Bulgaria, but uh, I can tell you that now that we are after the peak of the so-called second wave, we have a significant uh, drop of, uh, um, in numbers of the, newly, um, of the new cases. And now since early January, uh, our news are more focused on the number of recoveries because uh, they are used to explain as to be, to be explained as a positive outcome, a success of the imposed lockdown because we, we have uh, um, we are in the process of, re of uh, uh, releasing some of the, of the measures that were taken in uh, late November following uh, uh, as, as it shows on the picture, uh, a number of uh, more than 4,000 cases a day. So uh, another example, which uh, all of us remember because it happened only one year ago, in the early days of the pandemic, news outlets circulated colored maps of COVID-19 spread. And even, even if there was one, one single registered case, this would trigger coloring the entire country in red. And the maps quickly turned red when large land area countries were included. Now, if you compare it with the data that we have nowadays, you see that uh, it seems a bit uh, exaggerated and ridiculous. There is a very interesting research which you may you might be aware of uh, by a, a social media activist group called Avas, uh, which was made in April 2020, and which says that uh, on Facebook the content from the top 10 websites spreading health misinformation generated almost four times as many views as equivalent content from the top 10 websites of leading health institutions. To, to, uh, to make it shorter, it seems that official information is much less popular than the information which is spread from um, as, as fake information. 
All right. So um, why is this so? Uh, this is a matter of truth now that fake news travel further, faster, deeper, more broadly, because people, not computers, are those who tend to spread them. And that's why we are focusing on the cognitive aspects of, of this information, because at the end of the day, it is us who are responsible for, for all that uh, uh, situation. So there is another aspect that I would like to, to add to my presentation today, apart from those four main cognitive uh, um, concepts. These are the so-called cognitive biases. Um, scientists know that human beings are consistently, routinely and profoundly biased, but what is uh, bias? That's the idea that, uh, um, that we use, we all use uh, shortcuts and rules of thumbs by which we make judgments and predictions. Actually, the first time this idea was introduced into science dates back to 1970s and is uh, related to Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman, very famous uh, cognitive scientists. Uh, as of today, there is a huge list of, uh, uh, of biases, something like a long inventory of more or less known and well-described biases exceeding the number of 200. They correspond to different memory and cognitive issues, which define the way we perceive the world and react to its stimuli. For the purposes of my presentation, I, have, I obviously did not uh, uh, cover them all, but I have selected just a few. Uh, to demonstrate their importance on communication and on the topics that we are all interested in. So my selection is uh, uh, starts with uh, two biases that go hand in hand. This is the proportionality bias. In fact, this means the belief that major events must have major causes that fuel the desire to find out the big plan behind the curtains. And the other thing that it is uh, very closely related to is the so-called uh, intentionality bias, uh, which the simple, well, the simple ex explanation behind it is that events are definitely planned by someone. Just think of any of the conspiracy theories that we have all been uh, targeted with uh, in the recent months. By the way, all the new theories about COVID uh, are not, not new at all. They are just uh, some, some ideas that have been refurbished, but that have existed for a, quite a while. Uh, like the one which claims that Bill Gates plans to use a vaccine to manipulate or alter human DNA, or uh, the, which is closely related to um, the big plan behind mass vaccination campaign and actually the reason for inventing COVID-19 which is to uh, implant microchips to people in order to control them to serve world elites financial and who knows what else uh, interests so um, the reason why these these such theories become very very popular is that they have a significant number of of supporters who suffer from the so-called confirmation bias i say suffer but actually this is just a trait of our human brain so we are all inclined to, um, to having it, because this means just the tendency to search for, interpret, favor, and recall information uh, in a way that confirms our own pre-existing beliefs or hypotheses. Think about how often when you see the news feed, you just go for reading something that grabs your attention because you, you find it uh, similar to what you already know, and it is just uh, there to confirm uh, your, your beliefs. Uh, so, unfortunately, this, uh, this, this is not very innocent at all because, uh, for example, people generally prefer to spend more time looking at information that supports their political stance. By the way, this is very difficult to, uh, if, if someone is democrat, uh, he, he has democratic values, it's very, very difficult to, to make him uh, believe in Republican ideas and vice versa if we, if we take this example for the United States. Uh, people who believe in pseudoscientific theories tend to ignore information that disproves those theories. Scientists often display, uh, display that confirmation bias when they selectively analyze and interpret data in a way that confirms their preferred hypothesis, and this is why it is so dangerous. And uh, the last on my list, with which I'm going to wrap up my presentation, just not to not, not to um, uh, abuse of your take abuse of your time. This is the so-called authority bias, 
Um, this is something very interesting because it is re uh, related to human evolution. And uh, specialists think that uh, this is the reason why we survive, because in order to, to survive, human beings need to, to be in a group. And a group for a group to, to exist, uh, uh, leadership is very important. So we all need to have our leaders and to obey their authority. But as a matter of fact, we have uh, developed this uh, authority bias, which is the tendency to blindly follow or believe the instructions and views of a person in in authority. Teachers, doctors, police all hold a place on the pedestal of society and we tend to do what they tell us to do. Uh, for example, when a doctor tells a prime minister, a president, a king or a queen to remove their trousers and sit on the cold table, uh, they would most probably do so, just obeying the authority of the doctor. So my, my last example here represents uh, uh, the Major General Wenceslav Mutevchiski, who was appointed Chairman of the National Crisis Management Staff on 24th of February 2020. So there is a slight change between the, the picture on the left and picture on the right, because in the first, the, the early COVID days in March 2020, when we all had uh, this person opening uh, uh, the news and closing it with important messages on, uh, on the pandemic, he was wearing his military uniform and uh, this definitely caused a lot of fear and even panic. Uh, this guy is still the chairman of the National Crisis Management staff, but lately he is showing up in a more civilized outfit, as you see it on to the right of the picture. So there, there is somebody behind the scenes who is thinking carefully of the messages, of the nonverbal messages which are uh, um, going to the, uh, to the, to the audience. Um, and uh, more, probably they try to say that now they are in better um, command of the whole process and we need not to worry about it. Uh, so to wrap it up, the question is, what can we do about it? Knowing that it is all about uh, the structure uh, and the processes that take place in our brain. Is there really something that we can do to change this situation? This is a question that you can join us in answering because what I'm showing you are the results of a work in progress. And we are on our way because we have another ongoing project which is focusing at uh, trying to, to de-bias um, educators and learners uh, by successful teaching strategies. And we are on our way to, to think about those. Thank you for your attention and for your kind invitation to join your conference. I would be very glad to answer your questions if there are any. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Milena. I also remember you recently had this article about conspiracy theories, some uh, some quite, I would say, exotic ones that Finland does not exist and about the Denver airport. Yes. Yeah, and... Uh, and Finland, so, yeah. Yes. So, uh, how do you think uh, the social networks have been assisting in the spread of such theories or anti-vaccination sentiments and some other harm harmful information? Because okay, even before social networks were there, some 20 years ago, I think 90% of stuff on the internet was porn or other junk, but uh, still uh, so people could go to some forums to find uh, those thinking alike about flat f or whatsoever, whatever but uh, perhaps social networks with all the advantages also helped those people to spread their theories and even to undermine democratic processes more effectively in some countries including some well-established democracies that we wouldn't think some 10 or 15 years ago that something like that could happen in certain Western countries, which also we perceive them and they also like to be perceived as established democracies and strong democracies and consolidated democracies and so on. Um. 
in the course of preparing this article that you mentioned on the conspiracies, I've read lots of uh, studies about the role of social media on, on uh, the spread of conspiracy theories. And to my surprise, uh, the data shows that uh, actually the, the social media uh, is, is nothing but a tool. So uh, their role is to, uh, to make the spread faster and uh, uh, just to, to broaden a little bit its, its, um, its scope its reach because it's very easy just to, to with the click of a button you, you share it and it's gone uh, one thing which is surprising is that the so social media haven't done anything about the quality of the conspiracy theories uh, in terms of they didn't make it more this is almost more or less the same number of theories uh, because some some old theories were uh, converted into theories about COVID, for example uh, and they didn't make it uh, um, more rich in content because the, the very the very mechanism behind the conspiracy theorist is very limited. Uh, usually, they follow a very similar structure. They have a claim or two, and they are uh, like um, this is how how the process is, uh, is is exhausted and it is very very limited. There isn't a, a great uh, content variety of the conspiracy theories. So the social media is is the tool, and uh, uh, we are not to um, demonize it uh, by no means because uh, each tool can be used both for good ends and for bad ends. Uh, these are the people behind the tool, the people using the tool that we need to target if we are to think of policies of preventing uh, uh, the spread of misinformation and, and disinformation, definitely. Yes. Uh, thank you. And so you, you mentioned that uh, the vaccine is connected with altering the human DNA somehow, and it's a, an old story just refurbished for Absolutely. yeah to match the covid situation and uh, uh, yes uh, in armenia for several years we've we've had this sentiment a similar one not exactly about altering dna it was more about like causing infertility it was about the human papilloma virus vaccine gardasil but so, but uh, this uh, COVID vaccines, the issue about COVID vaccines being used to alter DNA on insect microchips somehow uh, continue that story and they pushed that story, I would say, to the backstage because in the last year, almost no one remembers Gardasil, but uh, still I can see how the old narratives were refurbished or somehow, I would say, maybe uh, recycled and uh, brought into the context of COVID. And also, would you see a parallel between the story of that old man who died? You said that the, the headlines were somehow manipulated and uh, stories about more recent stories already in the recent weeks or a couple of months like uh, about deaths related to vaccines so they give a title that someone died after this vaccine trial and then it turns out that uh, the person who died got placebo or it was totally unrelated and it's even not just recent couple of months i remember already last year in summer there was an issue about some ukrainian military men who died after injecting some american vaccine it was mostly about covid so it already somehow the same stories continued and refurbished recycled somehow so do you see the parallel between such titles it's it's a very um old technique of causing uh, emotional reaction emotional response uh, this is as i mentioned in my presentation uh newspaper headlines very often 
refer to this direct causality. They, they mention a fact and then may, they mention an outcome and you inevitably make the link between the two, although there is no such a link because uh, in this particular example, um, after they've imposed the lockdown uh, on this little, little town, everybody was shocked because such a thing has not happened for 40 or 50 years in this country. So all of a sudden people were so scared and so, so panicked that uh, it was very easy to claim that someone who um, broke the rule by, by escaping the place was found that, and this is what will happen to everybody who dares to do so. There was no relation to COVID whatsoever. The guy just got drunk and he left to sleep somewhere in, in the forest. Uh, but uh, this is, this is uh, uh, how to say, this is an approach of, of media because they, you know, they need catchy headlines just to attract more attention and uh, to attract more readers. It has nothing to do with, with the truth and it has nothing to do with, uh, although both facts are true, he escaped, yes, and he was found that, yes. So it's not about, it's not a matter of being uh, true or false. It's not a fake news, but the, the, um, the implication that there is a relation between the two facts is something which is uh, sort of viciously, uh, viciously used by uh, by the editor to attract more attention to trigger emotional reaction so uh, this is uh, uh, as I said all technique which is constantly in use by headlines to open any newspaper every day and you will see plenty of cases of course now uh, the target is uh, COVID vaccination campaign because um, there are so many questions which are not answered by science yet and this is a fruitful soil for disinformation and for manipulations of any kind. And with coming elections uh, in, in, a, in our country, for example, uh, any, um, any suitable occasion is used to, um, to show one thesis or another. For example, how the government failed to, to provide the needed number of vaccines uh, or how vaccines that they bought were not of a high quality compared to vaccines which are applied in other countries. You name it, any possible ideas uh, um, are just circulating around and everything has to be checked very carefully before we, we give our trust to one headline or another, which is tiresome and people never do that. Yes, and just one remark before I open the floor for more questions. You mentioned number of rec recoveries being now like in the focus of publications, and uh, I could uh, see a similar tendency in Armenia and uh, in several other countries as well, in, including some EU members. But that is indeed the case. So uh, thank you very much, Milena, and uh, I would invite other participants to ask questions at this stage. Yeah, I have just uh, just a short question. Uh, what is in your opinion? Because we talk uh, we talk at the previous meeting about about this. What is in your opinion uh, the the proper reaction? From uh, from the European Union in this war to combating uh, fake news and misinformation about about this pandemic, because uh, I think that we should explain to the population, to our societies, uh, that all those misinformations and all the, all, all this disinformation about about vaccine and and, uh, and about um, COVID nineteen, it's a part of the hybrid war, so. What is, in your opinion, the proper way uh, for the for the European Union to to, to manage this uh, this um, uh, this information? Uh, well, if you allow me, I will give you my personal opinion, not uh, um, not the one of uh, not officially of uh, of any of any organization. Uh, so. Sure. It's, it's a difficult question indeed. Uh, nobody knows the, the, the correct answer because it will take time before we see whether any decisions will give fruits or not. Uh, one thing they are trying to do now is to, uh, following the example of the United States after those scandals with uh, banning uh, Donald Trump from social media and stuff, is uh, they try to, uh, to, to uh, put forward the idea that what is, what is illegal offline should be illegal online and to impose um, some um, 
censorship not but uh, more stricter rules about the contents that social media put uh, um, online uh, because you know you now uh, know you know that now social medias have have no responsibility you can put everything on online and it's the responsibility of the users this is one thing they try to do officially i don't know whether this will bring to to any land to any good ends because it's a long path with lots of uh, legislation involved and uh, Mm, this is the, the heavy the heavy machine but in my personal view what needs to be done uh this is to 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 re-establish back to re-establish the trust into uh science and scientific authorities uh by um, meaningful campaigns to bring science closer to people because um first of all people should know that they don't have the expert opinion on vaccines so they shouldn't be involved in such conversations and this should not be tempting if you need an opinion about vaccines you should ask uh viral i don't know what's the name of the, the virus the, the the guy who who makes the vaccine uh, or at least a doctor because in our country uh, the, the public uh, image of, of the doctor is uh, is completely ruined because they speak on any occasion uh, with and or without expertise. So there is no, no, um, the public image of scientists, of, of doctors, uh, of experts is, is very much ruined. So I think that uh, um, there should be a general effort, effort to, um, to put back the trust into these professions who have the expertise to decide such complex problems as the problem of uh, whether the vaccine should save us from COVID-19 or not. Uh, it should be done by uh, appropriate uh, campaigns, information campaigns, by raising the awareness, uh, by uh, letting people know how easy it is to get uh, uh, tricked or to get um, mm, uh, misinformed by uh, news and by headlines, uh, and by interfering at the level of education. We need to introduce more teaching strategies which aim at preparing kids for this disinformation flow so that to make them aware of how to how to navigate in in the information uh, sea which is surrounding us and how to do it successfully because um, it's not a matter of uh, saying that one thing is true and one thing is false you know that fact checking uh, which we all hope that will do the job actually did a very little job nowadays everybody claims that they are fact checking so what my truth is not your truth. Is that right? I, I read my, my, my set of, the, of, of true facts and you read your set of true facts and we start fighting over what? Because the, nobody knows what is true in this world. Everything might be true. So this is not a question of fact checking. Uh, it, it is a question of uh, uh, shifting our attitude toward who are the experts, who are the people to know. Uh, like It's like restoring how it was in the past many, many years or many, even centuries ago. I don't know which was the, the period when those, those professions enjoyed more um, a better prestige, but uh, I think this is the way to go. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Uh, thank you. Other questions? Well, if uh, uh, there are no questions at this moment, I would like to ask Roger Fushibilski to take the floor now. So he is the editor in chief of Visegrad Insight, which is a very comprehensive publication on all issues related to Central and Eastern Europe. And I strongly suggest following it if you haven't done so yet. So, Wojciech, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Armen. Uh, I, I understand it's a, it's a summary discussion of, uh, of the project that you carry, we have been carrying out. Um, but uh, let me reflect on, on, on a few general points and also following what Milena has been presenting on the to say uh, social psychology aspects of it. Um, we're dealing at Visegrad Insight, of course, with, with a similar problem of, um, of false narratives. 
And these false narratives are, of course, there partly because there are certain actors who sponsor them, but also partly because uh, there is an ongoing crisis in journalism. On one hand, uh, I would say this, this ongoing crisis has been extended since 1990s, where internet has been putting a lot of hardship on, on quality journalism. And by quality journalism, I mean essential things like fact-checking, uh, editorial process, review, peer review, everything that happens usually in, in uh, also in the newsrooms. Also, what we are experiencing all across the board, this is not only Central and Eastern Europe, this is a global phenomenon. There is a decreasing number of people who can live off journalism. And that, uh, that is severely implicating or impacting uh, uh, democracies all, all around uh, the world. And in our part of the world, especially since journalism has been a fresh start uh, after 1989 for many of the countries we, we come from. And in other countries, it's, it's even, even more fresh start as, as uh, the autocratic regimes or uh, unfree regimes were, or partly free regimes that were only present. That, um, that said, uh, at the same time, there is another process that we observe. There is, uh, there is a global demand and in particular countries, each national public space, uh, a particular demand for, uh, for information, for analysis, for explanation. The consumption of journalism, of quality journalism, is actually on the rise. So these are, these are two, uh, two different uh, trends in a way that, that one can observe. And we see that also in, in Central Europe people are not only more interested in reading news, they're more interested to, to commit and to pay for quality news. But these are of course bubbles. We, the, the, the whole issue of bubbles is the real problem. The, the social polarization that is resulting from them is, is, is the real problem. And, and there, there isn't really a, any solution. It's a, it's a long-term investment to uh, to try to work it out and uh, to, uh, to, to be more and more inclusive with, with the bubbles you believe in, social bubbles that you believe in are, are, are of quality. Uh, now, of the recent trends that we observe in, and we have seen especially in the last year uh, since COVID, is that there are new actors and there are potentially new, uh, new scenarios for media landscapes, or what we call also in information sovereignty in, in Central Eastern Europe. Um, first, let me touch the new actors. We have been uh, traditionally usually attributing these information processes to, uh, especially in Central Eastern Europe, to one actor, which is, uh, which is Russia. But we are seeing increasingly um, more refined attempts to influence and misinform, to, to run shade, uh, sh shadow uh, PR campaigns and advertising campaigns by actors from uh, China. These are companies these are also um, lobbyists, uh, secret or public lobbyists of the interests of the Chinese uh, Communist, uh, Communist Republic of China that are operating here in, uh, in the region. And they try to advance Chinese interests in uh, what is a projection of a global struggle for uh, power and for the hierarchy of power between the United States, uh, China, United States, and uh, to some extent only Russia. So China has been very present, especially after the uh, break of the pandemic uh, with, and after the clash with uh, a verbal clash with the US administration, especially Donald Trump, on, uh, on the sources and on the blame uh, of, um, of uh, mismanagement, at least, of the, uh, of the virus. Uh, we have seen a lot of public outreach uh, by diplomatic sources, but we also see a lot of tension building up on the question of uh, tech companies, uh, um, the, uh, the, 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 the type of dependency that tech companies from China have not really to Chinese law, which is absolutely fine, but directly to the Chinese uh, uh, secret services and the, the one and only uh, uh, Chinese uh, Communist Party.
uh, with this with this floating on uh, on the air, uh, th there is more attention. There are there are more examples uh, of of clashes, also related to human human rights and and in a style that uh, nobody yet attributed before to to China, but has been known from uh, from Russia. That is about bullying. That is about uh, intimidating uh, journalists, intimidating countries. Uh, cases, uh, case in point, where it was uh, for a few times situation in um, in China, where uh, some politicians, uh, including uh, representatives of, of of Senate of Czech Senate, has been um, since by the way 1989 vocal supporters and real supporters to Taiwan's uh, independence uh, autonomy, and. Um, in the in the recent months, uh, the tensions uh, again went high up. As the the speaker of the Senate went to Taiwan to represent Czech uh, state and um, and sign a trade deal, recognizes Taiwan's uh, sovereignty in that domain. China uh, reacted furiously. Um, we have we have seen uh, different vo verbal threats. Uh, they were not as serious as uh, Russians, who were apparently attempting at um, at life of of some mayors, also in about the, the similar time. So uh, these elements of you, you wouldn't say only disinformation, but but uh, what what um, is also starting to become a new term in town of disinformation, the so-called sharp power. Um, uh, shadow and, and open influence of uh, non-democratic governments on uh, not only state actors, but civil society, media, uh, and, and economy in order to block them from uh, performing and, and operating in their full democratic uh, freedoms is, is really taking shape. And we, we start to observe it. We, we only start to report it in a broader uh, context but I believe this is uh, this is happening, and on the second um, and on the second point, as I started with the condition of journalism, uh, this is really important, and this is even more important to follow up because at the end of the day, no matter what information, disinformation, counter disinformation action you you take, this is always in the context, and in the context is here the quality and the resilience of of, of journalism. And the bad news of the of the uh, there, there is a, again bad and good news of the recent um, what is it ten months of the pandemic is that advertising market uh, nearly collapsed. Especially this is terrible news for the print press. Uh, nothing gets really printed, and no advertisement is going for print press, which was the the back backbone um, at least for the local journalism. Um, and local journalism gives this decentralized, this, this fabric of democracy in, in every country. And hence it is undermining the, the information, democratic information sovereignty of countries where, where societies uh, cannot be fully in control of the, uh, of the information and therefore make informed decisions. On the other hand, uh, the, the, the good uh, news of, of the recent months uh, are subscription rates online subscription uh, that was not even a considered mod model of, of, uh, for journalism uh, in, in the midst of the financial crisis 2008 has become already uh, very much driven by Netflix, uh, a new mode, a new business model and a hope for journalism. And we indeed see across the board, uh, wherever journalism is uh, having some subscription model, uh, it is usually smartly done, successful, and uh, subscription rates for many of the outlets across the world, but also in Central Europe. And there is a fantastic example from Slovakia, Den uh, are, are are only rising, uh, and the, they are rising rapidly, very efficiently, driving the you know, driving the subscription rates uh, for Den uh, from zero five years ago to sixty. 64,000 subscribers in case of Gazeta Wyborcza, the main daily in Poland, liberal, critical towards the government, um, recently reaching 250,000 uh, subscribers. 
So in a way, that's good news. As I told you at the very beginning, my, my, our perspective in, in researching the field of disinformation is focusing on this information sovereignty and it's measured by, by the question of uh, how many journalists can live off uh, the profession uh, freely and uh, without, without uh, compromising their uh, integrity. And, and on this on this uh, on this note, I would end because I think the ball is in the air, and we will only see. But uh, but there are some premises to to be optimistic, um, and ultimately to, to think that you know with with this crisis, it, it is not uh, it's not for sure. It is not said that journalism might not be even better off later on. Uh, with journalism better off, this is the best way to defend uh, democratic. Uh, um, information security, uh, simply speaking. Yeah, uh, thank you, Volcher. Uh, considering subscriptions, uh, do you know the story of a Hungarian, the new Hungarian outlet, yeah. Telex? I think it was even launched with found, uh, crowdfunding, if I'm not mistaken. Crowdfunding indeed is one form to how to start a business, a media business. And I spoke to the publisher and to the editor in chief, uh, Vera, um, not long ago. I, I, despite the pandemic, I'm traveling from time to time again to Budapest. And, um, and they are, after a very successful crowdfunding campaign, I think in, in a matter of months or two, they, they reach um, you know, 1 million euro easily. And they continue to count fun. So they had a very good start. They, they, they created uh, an investment uh, fund in a way to jumpstart their, their organizations. And the next thing they do is they want to convert uh, their free uh, readership into subscribed readership, perhaps with no payment initially, but at the end of the day to, um, to make it um, individual regular contributions. Because uh, yes, as I mentioned, the, the, the small contributions that are you know, they cost less than espresso uh, a month uh, or one of the other drink someone prepares are uh, in fact uh, life saving uh, for the information space in every country in every national public space. Hey, uh, thank you and uh, considering China, yes. Uh, I have also as I even started writing about that issue uh, Russian and both Russian and Chinese propaganda since March or April last year. And also I noticed how it worked you know such level that uh, some governments were persuaded not to impose travel bans early enough. So that was also perhaps miscalculation by the World Health Organization who had uh, in just beginning of February last year said the, the widespread travel bans were not needed. But uh, in some European countries, I believe the, there was this issue that uh, governments were afraid of losing revenues from Chinese tourism where it ended up in losing much more not only in money but in all different aspects and uh, indeed I think this uh, new spin by China and uh, some even uh, some perhaps mainstream Western media joined that campaign maybe not uh, they wish to do so but it coincided with the anti-trump agenda at some point and uh, well and i open now a reuters article from the uh, third of february last year actually when who chief told days no need to unnecessarily interfere with international travel and trade, meaning specifically ban of travel to China. And actually, the the title I may put the link uh, in chat, and 
the title is WO Chief said says widespread travel bans not need to beat China virus. So it goes through China virus at the moment and then uh, some political considerations uh, pushed uh, to create a new name. Even uh, there was this issue that uh, Taiwan's early warning about the spread of virus of, in China was not taken seriously. And uh, so uh, it's a whole field to study, I think, how it works. And uh, yes, I remember those stories about uh, Czech politicians, including the mayor of Prague, Grzyb, I believe. So, uh, any other questions or comments? Um, I, I rather have a comment uh, with regards to journalists. As someone who was uh, working in the field for three years uh, prior to the current position, I share your thoughts uh, and uh, understand it very well. But I think one important thing to mention here is that um there is a, a uh, there is a there is a certain certain blame to be put on those who are responsible for the PR uh, for the government agencies and other uh, government structures. Now what do I mean by that? Sometimes and sometimes even usually they are not cooperating well with the journalists. Rather, they try to defend their agencies and their structures so hard and so much not to allow their own workers to speak with journalists and provide information that is, that is really, really hard to translate to the human language uh, and to understand what do they mean by that. So they, in a way, build this fortress that all around us are enemies and we here are in safe space and we know the way how we should act we know the better so no one can actually criticize us and this does not facilitate the cooperation at all it actually makes it way harder so i do believe there's a part to be there is a partially we can partially blame those people who are responsible for this uh, pr so to speak. Should I respond here? I don't know. Is that, yeah. Um, that I, I just I just finished writing a, a piece for um, for another project, uh, and there is there is a growing number of uh, research. We were also part of uh, in another project. On, on the question of yes, PR agencies and, and jet, let's say the business of disinformation. And I think this was the headline of a, one Financial Times article. Uh, the new trends that comes into, uh, into looking at, uh, sorry if that doesn't answer directly your comment or question, uh, Artus, but, uh, but when you mentioned the PR uh, activity, this is indeed, um, a growing business all across the board and again everywhere um, having many journalists by the way recruited uh, for this business uh, previous, previous journalists so they know how to operate media if you want to earn better money and uh, and unfortunately the 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 janus face of disinformation with all the psychology with all the narratives with all the technology also of, of trolling robot trolling uh, behind it the Janus face of it is uh, uh, is is money. Uh, you earn money on this information, and PR agencies are specializing by now, or in Poland as well, in Czechia as well, on um, uh, on spreading this information for money, uh, and not only because some clients are paying for it. it spreading this information and spreading conspiracy theory can pay off very well. Uh, a Czech portal Conspiratorieska is uh, earning uh, the estimate is uh, 8,000 euro monthly uh, by spreading uh, conspiracy theories in uh, Czechia. 
uh, global uh, disinformation net index uh, estimated that um, now uh, I think it's uh, so conspiratory earns 7,000 a month. Uh, global information, um, global disinformation index um, estimate that 20,000 of the, of the websites they recognize as for sure disinformative uh, websites around the world are generating 80, uh, 80,000 uh, euro, uh, 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 sorry, no, 1 million, 1 point million a month uh, something, 1.23 1, 1, uh, euro per month, which is uh, an awfully lot of money. And, uh, and that's just tip of the iceberg. Another thing that is happening related to this information is digital ad fraud. Um, the, the type of incentives and the type of um, psychological, social psychology would say uh, response, reaction to this information naturally the feeling of anxiety, anger, uh, uh, uncertainty, the, the need to feed the, the, the monster of, of uh, you know, for, look for more information, confirmation bias, uh, all that. But it translates to attention that you, that you can translate to revenues from advertisements uh, on one hand, but also um, uh, to lowered, uh, lowered um, critical, uh, let's say, abilities of, 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 of navigating internet and clicking on fake links, uh, ads like this. There are very little litigations and investigations into that. In fact, uh, at the end of 2017, that was the only one that I remember uh, up until then. So the first one was 2017. It was joint action by Google and FBI to, uh, to break apart $300 million uh, digital ad fraud scheme. Uh, earning money on those small payments that people didn't even know they they're happening. They were extracting money from advertising budgets of, of big companies, putting money on digital advertising. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, as I said, I don't uh, <laughs> respond directly to, to, to your question, but, but PR uh, and PR business and the unethical or lack of ethical standards in this business along with other elements of that that are relating very much to the business of the disinformation and, and the money behind it. Yes, so, um, other questions? So uh, let them try to summarize maybe uh, Angela, would you like to step in at this moment? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Armin, for organizing the events and uh, being the, the lead applicant for, for the, the event. Um, I never thought before that uh, we will be able to, to join such an initiative. Uh, and I'll explain why, because we were not uh, were involved in uh, um, initiatives that uh, uh, approached disinformation. I was part of a team that uh, studied, studied in the past how, uh, how uh, uh, disinformation campaign were used in, the, in elections, but I never thought that I will be able to join a team uh, that will approach uh, disinformation during the pandemic. And uh, for, for, uh, for ESGA team, this was a challenge indeed. And uh, I think that we managed to, to reflect on what is important during the, the, during the pandemic. And we had different approaches on this, uh, on this crisis. And this is, this is very important because uh, mm, those actors that were involved, uh, what we monitored, what we uh, managed to do in such a short time, it is very important for, for our future activities. And only a few things to say. First of all, the initiative uh, that refers to uh, to disinformation campaigns, to the identification of the main themes, uh, conspiracy theories, uh, actors involved. Uh, I think these these initiatives must uh, must be continued at the at the regional level, not only at the local or national level. Uh, 
secondly, we should appreciate, we, we must appreciate the true importance of political, intellectual and civil society leadership because uh, these three categories of actors are very relevant uh, for future initiatives and for future of the uh, policy making uh, process. If these actors make mistakes, uh, we must uh, draw their attention and we must monitor the, their activities and to point out where they are wrong and give them the support that they need in order to, to avoid such mistakes in the, in the future. Also, I think that we need to, to think about solutions, not only to monitor what happens at the local or regional level, and not just to appreciate the state of affairs, to appreciate how um, one or another political actor acted during the, during the pandemic. Uh, this is not the most appropriate uh, uh, strategy from our part, I mean, from the think tankers and uh, civil society organization. Uh, in the future, I think we could reflect on some proposals, um, on some common proposals that can be applied uh, in uh, the states that we represent. Because as I mentioned in uh, one of the previous meetings, uh, at the beginning, I thought that we will have uh, the most uh, uh, worst case uh, uh, um, scenarios in the region, but in the end, I, I find out that uh, we have common challenges and we will have to overcome them uh, together. Uh, also, uh, what was really important during this uh, project, uh, because we are summarizing our activities, uh, it was important to explain during the pandemic uh, the following things. What messages do, uh, do public and political actors uh, uh, used uh, during the pandemic? if uh, they're uh, intended uh, to promote some misinformation uh, in order to have some uh, benefits in order to have to create some windows of opportunities to achieve long term political goals to change the legislation in force and we we had a lot of example in this regard uh, in the in the region uh, to encourage uh, fear in order to gain control over society uh, media literacy. This is another point that I would like to stress out as an important thing, because this is not a, uh, longer just something fashionable for, for us, for civil society or for media experts. This is also a necessity. Uh, and uh, this is a current necessity. And I think that in this regard, uh, we should um, encourage education uh, to be extended. I mean, in, in regarding the media literacy to be extended at local and regional level, where uh, uh, the people have access only to TV channels and not to, uh, to online uh, resources. Um, we must encourage the cohesion between uh, different uh, representatives of civil society. And I have in mind here the cooperation and the cohesion between civil society organizations and, and uh, uh, media experts. But I think to this uh, cooperation, we can ask to join uh, the IT sector, the technical experts. They can come up with some technical solutions in order to uh, to um, promote the decrease of disinformation uh, in online and not only online space, uh, but also uh, to find out some technical solution for for other uh, for other fields. Um, we must pay attention uh, to the way in which re religious cults, and I, I have in this case in mind the church, um, how they um, came closer to, to certain uh, social vulnerable groups and uh, how they approach them and what uh, messages they use to, uh, for, for disinformation as well and what are the interests that they, they, they promote. If they promote the interest of the church, if they promote the interest of, uh, of their own followers, or they promote some uh, foreign interest. In this case, I have in mind Russian Federation through, through the Russian Orthodox uh, Church. Also, we, I would like to stress out that uh, I think we must continue to, to work on um, 
monitoring how Russian Federation and other actors involved in with its interest in the in the region used this pandemic, used this crisis in order to achieve some uh, foreign policy uh, goals. Uh, for for me, as a representative of a or two countries in the in the region that. Uh, um, Followed some disinformation campaign in online related to the theory of conspiration, um, and not only. I think this is a very important and relevant thing to to monitor in the in the future. Uh, they mobilized a lot of human resources. They mobilized a lot of financial resources uh, to pursue their own interest and to uh, use these. Uh, window of opportunity related to the humanitarian aid and uh, mm, for vulnerable uh, social groups, I think this, uh, uh, this field should be uh, again monitored in, in, the, in, the, in not a short time, but I think in a long time. And how uh, uh, this humanitarian window of opportunity, how these uh, resources are used to uh, control political and economic process in, a, in certain regions, in certain countries. And I have in mind here also the vaccination process. And uh, an example in this case can be Ukraine, uh, where some political actors are promoting uh, uh, Sputnik V, um, and those political actors uh, are promoting uh, uh, not national interest of, of Ukraine. Uh, and in the end, I think we we should engage in a should be engaged in a responsible way, uh, and to appreciate correctly the role of the leadership in management of this crisis, uh, both at local and regional level, and also uh, to encourage the engagement and cooperation at the international and regional regional level as we did during this uh, six or eight months uh, in order to encourage cooperation as an essential uh, tool to, to produce qualitative change in the in the region because otherwise we will face a lot of uh, disinformation campaign and not only related to the pandemic crisis. Uh, I really appreciate our cooperation and really appreciate your engagement and uh, your leadership, Armand, and I think that we can uh, do great things together in the in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Angela. I also really appreciate your and Catalin's input. And yes, uh, we actually, yes, media literacy, which you mentioned, we currently have a project uh, on that, but it's an internally in implemented project uh, funded by Open Science Foundations Armenia. But hopefully, in the future, we can have some international projects in this field as well. And then the other issues that you mentioned uh, are also, of course, worth attention. Uh, there will be a continuous work on that. So, uh, Katalin, would you step in now, perhaps, with some remarks? Yes, thank you very much, and um, uh, I like to I like to thank you, Armen, for um, for for this opportunity to uh, to participate in this uh, in this project, and also for. Um, for your engagement in this uh, in this analysis project, today I'll be I will be extremely extremely short, uh, and I will I, I will talk I will talk shorter than uh, the last uh, the last meeting, and my intervention today will be um, or wants to be um, um, a conclusion. Um, about our our research and uh, analysis activity in in uh, in the past uh, a few months and uh, with uh, with your permission I will try to uh, to con to um, contextualize the general uh, the, the general um, issue of uh, of our activity so 
I will focus uh, on two extremely important issue, maybe may, maybe three, but but the last it's uh, the, the last topic it's it's clearly uh, tangential. So I will talk about uh, the pandemic and the the geopolitics and uh, also about the the strategic interdependence in our in our region because it it, it is very important to understand how this interdependence work. So first of all. Um, um, as I showed, and also we showed uh, at our last meeting, uh, the, the epidemiological crisis made, uh, made us aware that uh, we are actually living in a, in a, a worsening crisis. So a, crisis, uh, a, a crisis of lack of trust, a crisis of geopolitical games um, in, in each Europe seems to, seems to have already lost the, the match because um, our world strategy of the, uh, the, the, the continental strategy uh, to uh, outsource production chains uh, has, a, um, has cost us extremely, extremely much. Uh, Asia, uh, in my point of view, it's not only an economic tiger. Uh, in this case, Asia, it's a diplomatic and economic uh, colossus that never uh, misses an opportunity to, uh, to assert um, uh, its, uh, its supremacy um, in the international system. Unfortunately, and I think this is our, uh, this is our role uh, as experts, as technocrats, and, 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 and here I want to, to, to emphasize the word technocrat because I strongly believe that uh, the foreign policy analyst and especially the, the domestic policy expert uh, must be a technocrat, a technocrat without ideology. Um, so our, um, our duty is to, pr uh, to, to, to prove assess uh, and to, to provide um, expertise in, um, in, uh, in, in, in this field uh, to, to, to properly uh, assess the situation that have arisen and to draw attention to sensitive issues for the foreign uh, policymaker. Um, and uh, precisely because our role is to provide expertise, as, as I said, a concrete solution and even plans for, uh, for the future. So, um, I will make a direct, uh, a direct references to, to China, because this is very important for uh, this is very important for us and for our region. Although it seems to be a topic of little importance for uh, for our region, maybe for Europe, but I I, I would say the opposite. China, it's uh, it's the most concrete example. Uh, when it comes uh, uh, to when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, to diplomacy, from panda diplomacy, uh, we came to want to talk about road diplomacy or about health diplomacy. Although health diplomacy has long um, uh, has long been the, the the attribute of France, or uh, although the United States has has tried to gain major importance uh, in in this field. Unfortunately, China has managed to become the world leader in this moment when we talk about uh, health, uh, health diplomacy. Um, we are more and more connected to China. And uh, I could even say dependent. And the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that our region is, uh, uh, is un uh, undergoing a lot of geopolitical challenges. Uh, I make no secret that, uh, of the fact that I'm an expert on Nordic security and cooperation, and this helped me uh, to understand and to discover a, pot, uh, a pattern of Chinese diplomacy in, in into uh, European policy, from Chinese Arctic policy to to measure investment of vital interest to to our states and in the region. It is clear that China has become a big continental power, um, and um, is now on the verge of, uh, of conquering Africa. Um, those uh, nullifying the United Kingdom and French pol uh, political and strategic uh, importance on the, on the black continent. So I will stop um, 
I, I, I stop on, on, on this subject because I noticed in, 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 in this mount of pandemic, a Chinese avant-garde, a huge Chinese avant-garde, uh, both in Romania and, uh, and in Moldova. Uh, for example, in Romania, China has launched an, uh, an intense campaign to promote the strategic importance that uh, the Chinese authorities and Beijing uh, attach to, to, to Romania, to my country, um, actively campaign for, uh, for the granting of, uh, of a license to implement 5G technology in Romania. And the Romanian press report ex uh, extensively on some aspects of this information coming to, to China. And in my opinion, uh, Russia tried to counterbalance uh, the, this balance of power uh, on, uh, on the continent using this information in equal uh, excessive way as, uh, as China and, uh, and uh, uh, the Chinese companies. And regarding the question, what did we learn from, uh, from this pandemic? Or um, what uh, did the authorities learn from, from the mistakes made in this pandemic? I think I can list a few important uh, issues. Uh, first one, uh, the pandemic, it's becoming a field of, uh, of diplomacy and national security. And this is very, very important. In my opinion, uh, we can speak. Um, uh, we can speak about uh, minefield, because the instrumentation of national diplomacy during the crisis has shown that the European commitment to unity um, has turned into a race for uh, for survival in uh, in the international system. Each state becomes selfish again and try to. Uh, to return to, to, to the traditional alliance as, uh, as these alliance were before World War II. And Romania clearly uh, went, to, uh, went into the hands of, of France, uh, the, the public policy during the pandemic being a faithful copy of, uh, of what happened in, in France from the area of quarantine uh, to the, uh, to the uh, suspension of, um, of school and uh, universities uh, courses uh, in an identical manner. The second issue, I think that the media were uh, can be about the media war and misinformation. And the media war and misinformation have become weapons of geopolitical welfare. As we have shown uh, throughout our discussions, uh, the great powers have restored uh, to, new, to new forms of, of mass communication and social media in particular to, uh, to legitimize their, their action. Um, also, um, uh, but also to, to destabilize their, their uh, opponents. Russia, United States, even China have used new forms of communication to, to, to strike decisive blows in this, uh, in this um, uh, informatical uh, war. We must admit that we are at war and um, this war, it's a war of, of the multipolar world. I believe that the major failure of the European Union has been that it has failed to limit the effects of misinformation, as I said. And moreover, the European Union, um, through its ex uh, executive uh, apparatus, its executive bureaucrats, um, failed these misinformation actions previously by, by the Commission, uh, previously by the Commission. Uh, and uh, by, by, by the Commission's refusal to make uh, contracts available for the uh, supply of COVID vaccines. And the third issue, and I think that this is the, the most important issue, uh, would be uh, the mapping of a conflict and uh, a geopolitical strategy. Clearly, our region has been um, uh, severely affected by the coronavirus crisis. And what I can say about, about the way in which uh, the Romanian authorities manage the, uh, the, this pandemic extremely are, um, uh, ex externally are, are, are the, following, uh, the following things. 
Romania has uh, has clearly reaffirmed uh, its status as NATO and uh, and EU member country, and has um, uh, strengthened its position as as regional power. And Romania has looked closely at both Moldova and uh, and Ukraine, and has intervened extremely promptly in uh, in providing uh, medical assistance. So. It is, it, it is true that, uh, uh, that Romania has failed to expand its influence in the Eastern uh, Black Sea neighborhood, but I think as an EU member state, um, Romania, it's part of the EU's ex uh, external action plan. So in conclusion, our lives, uh, we must admit that our lives have changed dramatically, but we have uh, we have certainly learned to look at the whole geo geopolitical situation as a whole. Moreover, uh, I truly believe that in the future, um, we will be able to talk about the European unity um, only in, uh, in regional terms. Uh, maybe we'll be... Uh, this this thing with uh, uh, will we will save uh, Europe's um, uh, dominant position in the international system, and the security issue are extremely uh, issues are are extremely difficult to explain because the pandemic has uh, has shown us that we do not have a clear strategy for for uh, action and uh, essentially the regional cooperation um, uh, cooperation models that exist will have to change their structure of uh, of action with a new pillar in my opinion this new pillar uh, could be the health emergency pillar uh, why not maybe in the near future we will uh, uh, we will have a new form of cooperation from from the baltic sea to the caucasus but um i think and truly believe that our our project can be used by the by the uh, policy maker and the, uh, 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 the political leaders of our country to uh, to promote the interests of of our region so thank you very much again and i hope that we will cooperate in uh, in the in the near future. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Yes, you made just uh, several valuable points that show the underline the need for more work in this field, and uh, certainly there is a place for cooperation in the future, and hopefully we can develop it. So, and. Uh, so, Alexandra, would you yes. share your thoughts now? Yeah, Kathleen, thank you so much for your presentation. Actually, I have some commentaries and uh, some questions to you. If I understand you correctly, you before said that European Union failed on the vaccine politics, right? Or in, I'm incorrect understanding your doubts. Is it right or is it not? Can you please? No, is it, is, is it right? Is it right? Okay, then I have, first of all, um when then how you imagine how this situation should be developed if we understand that the, the medical side of the European is not in this uh, competency so so for instance the medicine is not just European Union part but uh, it well the countries have its own sovereignties on this part of the European Union and the vaccine politics they just cannot be developed as easiest as we as it should be because of the complexity of the countries. So, and in that case, I have some questions, which is, uh, first of all, uh, probably you heard about the European Medicine Agency and the European Center for Disease Prevention, which, and uh, also the control, which was created in the first waves of the COVID situation and uh, COVID pandemic. And uh, it's actually really operating, was working on a European level, but the hardest part of that was that, um, most of the society's parts and countries never heard about it, but uh, from from the perspective of the mask and uh, and all the countries received the um, 
necessary uh, improvements from the European Union, it was exactly this center. And I was going to ask your opinion. So if we are talking that uh, it failed on the vaccine politics and it failed on the so much stages, then what should be improved better? And uh, if we don't consider that there was actually an action, which we usually just didn't hear. So this was my first question. And then my second question was about do you hear about European Union's article 222, if I'm correct? So you were talking before about the bureaucracy. And uh, if we're talking about European Union and exactly this article, it's about, basically it's about um, then when the European Union countries receive some diseases, crises, and if uh, you was mentioning before that you called coronavirus as a war, uh, then uh, there is an article 222 which is uh, uh, which is providing help to the countries which receive these diseases and uh, some problems in the countries. So what is your opinion on that? What is the problems why this article which European Union have and they should be integrated in the part, they didn't do that? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Alexandra, for, for your comments and for your, for your questions. First of all, when we talk about the European Union and we talk about um, uh, the, the problem with, with, the, um, uh, with the vaccine strategy and the communication strategy, we talk about uh, the lack of transparency. Uh, when the European Union assumed its role to promote the, uh, the uh, official communication about uh, the pandemic, about uh, uh, the, the vaccination process, uh, they should know that uh, the people want facts. The people um, in this crisis, we, uh, we understand that the people don't want to, uh, to, be, uh, to be lied at the TV. And in my opinion, it is very dangerous for the European democracy that the European Commission don't want to, uh, uh, to, to, to give us, to the large public, uh, the contracts negotiated by the Commission with uh, the pharmaceutical um, uh, companies. And this is what the European Ombudsman said. Uh, the people must know uh, what and how the European Commission negotiate this, uh, all, all those awkward uh, accords with with uh, with the pharmaceutical uh, companies, because in my opinion, uh, this Commission, von der Leyen Commission, failed, and it's the it, 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 it's it's more worse than uh, than than the previous Commission, and more worse than the lower Commission. Uh, and um, as you mentioned, um, the the health public uh, the health public system it's uh, it's regulated by the by by the states. And the, the the EU the EU treaty said very clearly at the fourth article that uh, the the disease and the pandemic disease um, should be regulated only by the state. But I repeat. When the European uh, Union assumed its role as leader and uh, said to the, to, the, to the national government, okay, we will negotiate it for you. We will negotiate it for, for, uh, for, for the union in the name of the European unity. Then we should know that how, you should know how to communicate. You should know how to uh, uh, proper um, assure um, um, a correct, uh, a, a, a correct vaccination and a proper vaccination campaign, because in my opinion, the vaccination com campaign also failed. Um, and I think that if the Commission will not, uh, will, will, will not uh, gave us more information about the about the uh, the, the contracts then the European Parliament should make its duty, should control uh, uh, the, the commission and should, uh, should came to in, in front of us 
to came Mr. Uh, Mrs. Uh, von der Leyen and asked very clearly, what and how you negotiate. And, 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 and by the way, I, I, I hope I, I answered to, to your question. And by the way, I'm not eurosceptical, but I'm very realistic. I'm very realistic and I really hope that commission will clarify this situation because it's in the, uh, it's in the interest of the European Union. We should, uh, we should clarify this because many governments start to, uh, to, to, to ask the commission why we are not uh, involved in, in this process, why you decided this. We don't know why commission uh, chose uh, AstraZeneca or uh, BioNTech vaccines and why they don't choose, I don't know, the, 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 the Sputnik V. And the commission should answer to, to, to all those questions because it's in, it, uh, it's, uh, it's in your, it's in uh, its uh, um, uh, advantage to, to, to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Alexander, will you make other points? Just to the Catalan or uh, from the Latvian? No, just to, as a wrap up, maybe. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, so from the Latvian Institute of International Affairs, um, I would like to say thank you, Armand, for your leading. It was a um, great opportunity and possibility to be part of the project. Um, also, thank you, colleagues, uh, for a wonderful webinar together. And uh, I think it was um, really interesting to see diverse approaches from uh, different countries' perspective and uh, also to provide monthly bulletin articles when we analyze our uh, country's actions. And um, as today we are concluding our project, um, and Angela and Kathleen expressed great recommendations in the future, what we can have. And uh, there is really hard to add something to that, but um, I would like to, if Arthur also allows me, then uh, conclude on Latvian part, which uh, this project, what few few recommendations and few few theses which uh, we have. And uh, I think uh, what is more, to, um, I guess, note for me to say about Latvia is that um, how the whole situation developed actually, because in the first wave from the February till uh, up mostly July, uh, the Latvian position itself, and it was a really um, known story as a Latvia success story to the COVID. It was um, on all magazines, on all articles, and uh, there was a quick actions from the government, uh, high level society trust and uh, campaigns to defend possible disinformation and conspiracy theories. And uh, there was even a Baltic bubble created uh, when, uh, all, uh, when all European countries have a lockdown. So uh, three Baltic states, Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia had the possibility to travel between three countries. And uh, on the second wave from August till uh, end of November, November, we experienced the society lack of the trust and uh, uh, there was a new different uh, restrictions and, uh, with no explanations to some of the government actions um, and uh, actual disinformation started to grow up. And what we see now in the third wave from the, uh, I guess it's almost from the December and actually it is uh, closely compared to because of the vaccine, um, there is a complete society lack of trust. Uh, there is no trust, there is some uh, protest which was organized before. Uh, there is a really strange and different restriction in, uh, in uh, our country. And uh, there is no explanation from the uh, actions of the government. And if they are, there is no reasonable and no understandable. And uh, what is the most uh, worst scenario is that most, mostly almost the I guess half of our society is against of the vaccination. So all this success story become in the end, which was the great beginning, they just uh, fall down. Uh, and um, and what I can say about that, that uh, it is great that we have this possibility as a different think tanks to talk about this situation, this problem, and also this information as uh, think tanks are the main 
power may channel to to provide information not only for the society but also to the government and i think this is our uh, responsibility to 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 provide experience and provide explanation how we can uh, deal with this situation and uh, yeah that's quickly from me and my point maybe my colleague arthur do you have something to add but I think that no. Uh, so from the Latvia part, is a, it is a quick remark from my side. And um, thank you once again, Armen, and thank you colleagues for this uh, project and possibility to be a part. Uh, thank you. And uh, about the number of uh, population currently not willing to get vaccinated, this 40 something seems a very popular number in uh, several Central European countries as well, and the more or less uh, like 41, 43 in Hungary, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, something around that in Poland, in, in Georgia also about 40. We don't have uh, such numbers for Armenia, so there is no sociological data like that. But uh, uh, seems in a lot of countries, in, in some Western European countries as well, this is uh, just below half of the population of 40 so something percent seem to be skeptical now. The problem is that it's not even uh, the usual society, a society as, uh, as the citizens. The problem is that even the medics, which uh, usually the government says that the, that the medics should popularize the vac vaccination process, but they are against that. So the, it is only growing the society as a general number to and also the citizens, which is not uh, which is not planning to vaccinate. Yeah, I mean, you were saying before, sorry to interrupt you a bit. So in this case, uh, it's uh, yes, a bit unusual that medics are against vaccination because uh, they, it seems they should have known the story the best about uh, variola and uh, measles and mumps and uh, cough, uh, whooping cough and a lot of other diseases, but uh, this time uh, seems there is more effective propaganda and uh, maybe this microchipping or altering the DNA stories uh, have been working more effectively in this case. Uh, because, well, uh, some of the vaccines like uh, seasonal flu vaccines also don't give uh, lifelong protection, but uh, still uh, there haven't been any sentiments like this against those. But in this case, we see that uh, uh, this is an unprecedented campaign globally going on. And again, some just uh, there were fresh news today in some countries, uh, like stop Bill Gates, like uh, the, the pun gates to hell. So like uh, if you get vaccinated, you maybe uh, dump and go to hell sometimes. So uh, these things are very strange actually. And uh, this is a phenomenon that still has to be studied and also in the other field, in media literacy and information field, there is also work to counter it. Uh, thank you again. And after some final remarks, maybe. Sure, sure. As to final remarks, I guess um, in a way I have to one more time stress the thing that I stressed before uh, talking to Wojta. Um, strategic communication, although may not be at the first look the most important things when it comes to disinformation and communicating with uh, society, when, when it comes to indeed communicate correctly um, government thoughts, government plans, when it comes to 
persuade society that um, the government agency is not your foe, foe, but actually someone was trying to help you in the first place. When it comes to fight against this information, this strategic communication becomes particularly important. And if you look at uh, states that indeed are successful in fighting uh, COVID-19, you'll see that um, indeed the strategic communication on behalf of the government was effective. For instance, let's look at Finland. They are doing very well in fighting COVID-19. One of the reasons why is that people trust the government. Why they do? Why they trust the government? Because government uh, have very well established communication system, and strategic communication is one of the best. So this is one very important thing. Second of all, in a way, in a way, it's connected to the disinformation, but um, I couldn't say it's strictly connected. Uh, it's very important to always be ready and prepare for the worst case scenarios. Uh, it's in a way very painful for me to say, but Latvia here can be used as an example. Um, during the first wave of the COVID-19 in spring, Latvia did pretty well. Uh, in terms of um, cases, in terms of deaths from COVID-19, per, per, per million people, Latvia was, was one of the best in Europe, maybe in the world. So everything was, again, in comparison, very, very good. But um, instead of preparing for the second wave, which is, which was inevitable, and everyone knew this, um, I would, I wouldn't go as far as to say that we did not, not we did nothing, but still, um, so many things could have been done in order to prepare for the second wave, way better, but unfortunately, unfortunately, this opportunity was not used to prepare for the second wave effectively. So the second lesson. Uh, that we should be learned from from this is that you always have to be ready and you always have to be prepared again in a way it doesn't connect to this information in the most direct way but it's still something that you have to have to bear in mind even in terms of disinformation as well you always have to be prepared that someone is going to spread this information so you have to debunk it as fast as possible otherwise you may find yourself in a situation that society does not trust you at all and find the information that is indeed disinformation find it fruitful and believe in this so you also have to be prepared to, to debunk it as fast as possible so this is the two lessons that i do believe are the one the most important when it comes to disinformation and COVID-19. And a solution to them, mm, I, I guess uh, improving um, strategic communication as well as improving public relations and opening up. This is something that I do believe and do find very, very important. I said it to, to Voice and I may repeat it one more time. When uh, press secretaries that are working with the state agencies do not cooperate with journalists, rather they prefer to close up and uh, make the fortress of their agencies, they do not help at all. Um, in reality, doing, they are doing quite the opposite. Um, there is, there is no trust. And uh, when there is no trust, it's really hard to communicate with, with the society. So um, from my perspective, they should open up, be 
being welcome and uh, not only to, to the journalists, but the society in general. That's how I see it. Uh, thank you very much, Marcus. Actually, uh, I remember that during the first wave, Latvia, along with Slovakia, had the lowest number of death per million people in Europe, followed by Bulgaria. Exactly. But, uh, yeah, but then in Bulgaria, I think uh, it wasn't since June they already allowed some uh, attendance and football games and some other activities, so the situation started worsening and... Well, in Latvian case, yeah. if you if you mean that uh, all of a sudden we had no restrictions, no, it wasn't the case, yeah, however... That, that wasn't the case. Yeah. Obviously, obviously, in a way, uh, some restrictions uh, weren't um, loosed up a bit, obviously, but... Um, um, I would rather go as far as to say that um, these restrictions uh, that needed to be uh, strengthened uh, in time were not uh, during the during the, the the autumn. So, for example, um, mm, if especially this is in particular interesting that we had an Israel case just developing in front of our eyes in August uh, that when they opened schools these one uh, schools were, were, were one of the places with the coronavirus were especially fast uh, spreading we had this example in front of the eyes but we basically did nothing uh, we in a way, somehow started to restrict uh, uh, schools, if I'm not mistaken, in October. So it's quite a lot of time passed by when we started to do something when it comes to schools. And I don't m mention other places. So the reaction wasn't, uh, the reaction was slow, especially again in comparison with, uh, with spring when uh, I guess it was three or four cases when Latvia actually implemented quite successful, quite 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 significant restrictions, but this time in 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 autumn uh, they were not so fast, so to speak. Yeah, in the autumn we saw that in several countries which uh, dealt pretty well in the spring and summer it went much worse Hungary the Czech Republic in the Czech Republic which was the first country in Europe in the spring to impose masks at public places it went out of control in autumn and especially in late December early January the highest rates in the world so well in uh, December, the government was uh, already reluctant to impose restrictions on um, entertainment and shopping centers. And, uh, there were huge crowds uh, going for Christmas shopping. So, in to be honest, in Armenia, we had uh, this per uh, like perception in February much that it was more like our people's uh, way of behaving that but uh, apparently people get tired with such restrictions during months uh, then uh, uh, the approach changes uh, the approach changes and even uh, some people who behave differently uh, most of the time may start behaving this way but uh, also the important point about uh, trust in the government we see that in Sweden, even though it's their policy is not popular among other countries' governments, still uh, their population uh, trusts them. It, it's a long tradition, the same probably Nordic tradition like in Finland, uh, trust in the government. And 
uh, this may be somehow related uh, to also uh, well we see also this uh, trust in the government playing important role in New Zealand for example but also some countries like uh, Taiwan and some Asian countries uh, which also had this uh, social trust tradition well Japan even though recently the situation has been worsening but uh, Japan had quite uh, loose regular restrictions not um, many restrictions uh, during all the most of the time although they had this mask wearing as a in the streets as a tradition for years now so that may also have played a role so still the, the issue of trust is a very important one and but it depends because in some countries uh, the governments would say they are trusted but uh, but uh, they are rather popular because of the, some populist politics they pursue i would say in our country as well so which uh, may be the most trusted government since independence but uh, very populist so uh, uh, there are a lot of issues again to study and to assess as public policy options and uh, make recommendations in this field as well so thank you very much uh, so dear colleagues i uh, want to thank everyone once again for participation in this project and hopefully uh, we can uh, continue working in this field with uh, one sponsor or another there has been some interest but uh, still uh, on behalf of some sponsors but uh, careful so far but hopefully we can develop it and uh, we can still have some publications uh, in the Newstone Europe and uh, some other sources may be available for that so we may still consider doing this in the coming weeks so uh, thank you very much and have a nice evening and please stay in touch and uh, i hope to meet you soon and hopefully in a few months uh, in person as well that sooner or later life may start going into a normal mode because uh, for me this new normal is totally abnormal i i should say uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Armin. It was indeed a very a pleasure to work with you. And uh, thank you very much, Angela, Catalina. It also was a very, very big pleasure to work with you. Indeed, I enjoyed uh, very much being uh, part of this uh, project and uh, being here present my thoughts and my views in part with uh, Alexandra. I find it very, very interesting. So thank you very much indeed. Yes, so, yeah, indeed. So have a nice evening and please stay in touch. Uh, we still can accomplish yeah. some work together. Thank you. Yeah, have a nice evening. Bye. Bye. Bye.